into uh, our presentation, presentation materials on uh, FIRA and on the changes in the Department of Homeland Security fiscal year 2013 funding. So as a company, uh, as, as uh, Paul Moon had mentioned, we provide governments, nonprofits, and corporations with a solution that empowers them to manage emergency situations from preparedness to response to recovery and improve the coordination of people and things on a daily basis and on a catastrophic basis. We've been doing this for a while. We've been in business since 2002, and we have over 100 customers, and uh, we're coming out with a version of our cloud-based logistics solution uh, later on this year. We do have a team of 285 subject matter experts that each have a minimum of 20 years of experience in some facets of emergency management, and these folks help to design our software and, and guide us with respect to initiatives like we'll, that we'll be talking about today, such as funding. So without further ado, let's get into the materials with respect to this webinar. And we're going to start first talking about Thyra, and we're going to re uh, relate Thyra over to FEMA's whole community approach to emergency management. But it's kind of important, and, and by the way, you're going to see a lot of text on these slides. I know the, the, the traditional uh, presentation mode is to, to have less on text, but this is really a meaty kind of topic. Uh, and I'll, I'll do my best here as you're reading through the slides to go ahead and, and point out things that are good takeaways for you with respect to these initiatives. But first off, Thyra starts with PPD-8. The Presidential Policy Directive 8 uh, was designed to facilitate a whole community's approach to preparedness and response. And it kind of, uh, something, a couple of things to really draw out from this slide and the next one is whole community being one, being able to be capabilities based in your approach to, and then three, what is it that you can do in response to the threats that you face at the local level to measure and um, and document the capacity that you have to respond to emergency situations. But it starts again with PPD-8. So the directive is calling for the development and maintenance of national preparedness goal that defines the core capabilities that are necessary to prepare you at the local level, up to the state level, up to the national level, against risks that, that threaten the security of the nation. And what the directive did, and by the way, in each of these slides, you're going to see the sources at the bottom for additional information of where we got this information. So PPD-8 follows through with the National Preparedness Goals. And in general, the National Preparedness System, and this comes straight from FEMA's website, is outlining an organized process from everyone in the whole community, there's that phrase again, to move forward with your preparedness activities and to achieve the National Preparedness Goals and, you, and improve your capabilities at the local level. So it goes through a couple of, of basic steps, and Thyra is the first part of this. Identifying and assessing your risk is the first one. Creating your capacity to respond to emergency situations and to those risks that you've identified. Second, being able to build and build your capabilities through a whole community approach. And whole community doesn't mean just yourself anymore. It means everyone that might be a partner to you. It might be your, if you're at the local level, it might be a, a mutual aid partner like another county. It might be a, a state partner. It might be a nonprofit organization such as uh, down in uh, uh, in the southeast, uh, the Baptist provides uh, mobile kitchens to the state of Florida and Georgia and Alabama. It might be a uh, corporate partner, a, a supplier that provides food or water or medicines uh, related to, uh, uh, to survivors in disaster-affected areas. But the whole community means it's not just you anymore. It's everybody around you. So you're going to have to identify and assess your risk. You estimate your capabilities to respond to emergency situations. You identify how you can build that capability and then how to sustain it. You move that into your response plans, you validate it, and then you pursue and update it. And this is what you're going to have to be doing both at the state level, certainly, and then the, the states are going to be encouraged to locals into the same kind of program. So let's continue on and, and, and build the path here from the National Preparedness System. The first step is Thyra. Thyra is a Threat Hazard Identification Risk Assessment. And it's a common risk assessment process that's identified that helps you to identify, understand, and manage what threats and risks that you have, and not just what you have, but also in the context of your community and also in the context of timing. For example, in Tampa, uh, in the summertime, you would think that a hurricane would be the number one threat that was in that area. Well, during the time of the Republican National Convention, that was the number one threat. So within the context of the community, within the context of a special event, and with the within the context of, of the timing, in terms of calendar timing, your threats and your risks change. Thyra is going to help you to identify that and then to build on the assessment efforts that you already have in place to help you take this data and identify the desired outcomes that are um, how your community is going to be able to improve your capacity to respond to that specific threat 
against the lens of the core capabilities that have been identified in the National Preparedness Goals that you saw on the previous slide. So you're going to have capability targets. And you're going to say, OK, from this risk, here's my target of how I'm going to respond. I need to measure my capacity, which is local assets, local people, the credentials of your staff, the kinds of resources that you have. And then I need to figure out how to obtain and use more resources from the whole community to better prepare me for that risk that I'm facing within that context. I'll give you another good example. Uh, when the tornadoes occurred that, uh, through the southeast that started all the way in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and went through Tennessee, they came across the town of Ringgold, Georgia. Now, Ringgold, Georgia already had identified threats uh, for a tornado. They had a capacity respond in terms of their law enforcement, their fire service, and their EMS. But it was a catastrophic event for Ringgold. The whole community approach would be to say, OK, if a catastrophic event occurred again, exactly where do I get more things that my community needs in order to uh, respond to the situation and then to recover from it? That response might be additional response assets. It might, uh, the restoration might be debris removal equipment. It might also be generators uh, for individual assistance that you could get from other suppliers, the local Home Depots down the street. So your whole community approach isn't, again, just your own capacities, but the capacity of you to respond to specific threats over time and then to establish those new goals, those new capabilities, and then measure your, your improvements to that over time. We'll get into the measurement of that in just a second. The source of the fire here you see at the bottom, the Comprehensive Preparedness Guide 201, uh, which can be viewed online. We also have a copy of it as well. So FIVER really is an ongoing process directly related to the whole community preparedness effort. So as an organization, once you go through and you measure yourself, and I'm going to, as an organization, the FIVER really does apply not only to states that, it, that are going to do their preparedness reports, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's also at the local level as well. The local emergency management agencies are encouraged to go ahead and do a FIRA locally, and then they'll roll that up to their regions or, or to the states. But it's going to help you to identify who your additional partners are on the mutual aid side, your NGO partners, your corporate partners, uh, also how things work within the capacities on the state and the federal levels. This is going to dovetail into your emergency operations plan development, into your hazard mitigation plans, and basically what you've identified in terms of the threats within FIRA, your capacities respond, and then what you need from the whole community to sustain your response efforts needs to roll into your plans. This will also help you to prioritize your assets and your equipment purchases over time to figure out what kinds of staff that you need and, and how to hire the people of, of specific credentials that you need to be better prepared over time. And then that would dovetail into your exercises as you do your drill exercises and your training over time. Now, what's important to say is that uh, you get into some, some areas of the, uh, of the nomenclature here as you look through FIRA and you look through the National Preparedness Goals. As it, it seems a little loosey-goosey. Because people are talking about performance measurements, but then again, they don't really say how it's going to be measured. They do say it's going to be peer reviewed, but they do, and they do make it sure that you're responsible for measuring things over time. But they don't tell you how to do that. Is that through paper? Is it through technology, et cetera? Here's what we do know: for fiscal year 2012, the FIRA's results are the first steps of the state's preparedness reports. So the core capabilities that are identified as part of FIRA are going to be measured on an annual basis. The state is required to develop and sustain a FIRA. Urban areas are required to develop and sustain a FIRA, and also to provide that up to the state and roll it in the state's report. The local agencies that are not in urban areas are encouraged to be involved, and it's in the state's interest to do that. Why? Because starting in fiscal year 2013, which we'll get into in just a second, the grant funding is going to be based on DHS's evaluation of your assessments and ongoing uh, improvements, which is really performance and project-based assessments. And the source of what I'm telling you for is in the Grants Program Directorate, Bulletin number 385A. That came out June 1st of this year. OK, so that's FIRA. How does that change, or how does that modify, or how does that uh, get affected by the changes coming up in fiscal year 2013 now? Uh, for the Department of Homeland Security grant programs. Let's take that on, and then we'll move it all back together and kind of tie it together with a nice little bow. So the Department of Homeland Security in fiscal year 2013 is consolidating 16 prior grant programs into one. So you see here all 16 that existed in fiscal year 2012 and earlier that are now getting rolled into one program called the National Preparedness Grant Program. Now, the Emergency Management Performance Grants and the Firefighter Assistance Grants are not consolidated. So basically, you'll have the National Preparedness Grant Program, which consolidates all those 16 that you see on the slide. 
and then you'll have the emergency management performance grants and the firefighter assistance grants. You can go online to the DHS um, website or the FEMA website and see links to exactly how much money this means as it breaks down between the grant programs. And it's pretty enlightening to see how much money is getting rolled up into the new NPGP. For fiscal year 2013, the National Preparedness Grant Program is going to focus, focus on, sounds familiar, you've heard about core capabilities before, where did you hear about them in the National Preparedness Goals? So of course you're going to be focusing on developing and sustaining the core capabilities identified in the National Preparedness Goals. Grantees, which would be the states and then of course the locals applying to the states, they will be asked to justify your decision via your proposed project. How over the life cycle of the funding that you're going to receive that you're able to sustain or improve your current capabilities and address gaps in capabilities. What's also important to realize is the capabilities in terms of fiscal year 2013 are measured because they're focused on assets that you can cross jurisdictions with and deploy to other folks. So your capabilities and your performance measurements are now going to be focused on what you're looking to do that can cross jurisdictions, be readily deployable and multi-purpose at the regional and the national level. So therefore, when you're saying, I need some funds to go do this, if it is something that is a deployable resource across jurisdictions, it's more likely to get funded. Now all that is going to be peer-reviewed and based on risks that you have identified in your thyra. The National Preparedness Grant Program is going to encourage you to focus on life cycle planning. And this means that your inventories and your resources will be identified across the whole community. And again, the whole community being not just you, but who else can support you, your mutual aid partners, your corporate partners, your nonprofit partners. So they're going to they're encouraging, and you, you got to love the use of the, the use of the word encourage, and it, they encourage before the locals to do a thyra because it's going to roll up to the states. They're now encouraging you to do life cycle planning, which basically says, all right, if I've identified my risks and threats, I know my core capacities, I've identified uh, who else in my whole community can it help me improve my capacity to respond to catastrophic events, and then I'm going to ask on a project-by-project -project basis for something that is cross-jurisdictional and deployable so it's useful not only to me but to my partners and to uh, my mutual aid uh, partners, then I need to start cataloging and planning for my local inventories, inventories and my resources. So you need to reach out to your corporate partners. You need to reach out to your mutual aid partners, and you need to have something that catalogs and helps you to measure your capacities over time, which kind of indicates that paper-based solutions really aren't going to be the right approach. We'll get into to technology versus paper in just a second. The NPGP awards are going to be based on prioritized core capabilities, validated assessments from Thyra, identification of needs and gaps, and then your ability to say, I need money for this project to sustain my capabilities to respond to this threat, and oh, by the way, these assets are deployable to my mutual aid partners. Those are the ones that are more likely to get funded. The source for everything I just said, fiscal year 2013 vision document from February 2012. So what does all this really mean to you and your organization for FATHIRA and for fiscal year uh, 2013 uh, NPGP? If you are a state emergency management agency, and there are a few of you on the call right now, you're going to need to complete a thyra. You need to make sure that your urban area uh, jurisdictions within your state also complete thyras, whether that's city or county or both. Roll that up into your state preparedness report and submit that no later than December 31st of this year. That's for fiscal year 2012. You also should contact your local emergency management agencies and provide them with thyra assistance and tools. As, you, uh, as mentioned before, local communities that are not in urban areas and local counties not in urban areas are encouraged to do thyras. Why? Because starting in fiscal year 2013, that data will be critical to the state in order to receive funding and to facilitate the ongoing performance measurements that are going to occur on an annual basis that will be peer-reviewed by folks within DHS. Fostering whole community partnerships. It's really important for you and your local agencies to identify and document your mutual aid, nonprofit, and corporate partners. And it's important for you to maintain membership in EMAC. The Emergency Management Assistance Compact is mandatory, that membership, for you to receive funding fiscal year 2013 and beyond. 
Fourthly, you should consider a technology solution for you or your local agencies in order to develop and sustain your capacities and your capabilities and include your mutual aid corporate and um, nonprofit partners, then it really makes more sense to do something on a, on a system approach that's integrated and can help you to flow through your assessments into your response plans, measure your capacities, have a resource catalog, and know what to do with it. We'll get to that in just a second. If you are a local EMA, get familiar with Thyra. Take a close look at the guidance documents, complete it, and work with your state to include it in their state preparedness reports. You also, at the local level, need to build whole community partnerships. Disasters are local, and free to reach out to your mutual aid, NGO, and corporate partners is a good idea. You as well need to maintain membership in the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. And finally, locally, consider a technology solution. In order to measure how you and your region can develop and sustain those capabilities, using technology is going to save you dollars, and we'll get into that in just a second. Finally, don't think you're left out in the whole community approach if you're a corporation or if you're a non-governmental organization or a nonprofit. Number one, contact your local and state EMAs. It's really in your interest to provide them with resource and personnel data as part of the whole community response effort. Not only does it uh, assist your preparedness at the local level, but it also potentially could give you some business if you are a nonprofit or a corporate partner. If you identify what kind of stuff that you have at the local level, even if you're the local auto dealer that's helping out with vehicles, if you're the local uh, Ace Hardware that has generators, if you're the, the um, you know, a, a water or you know, base camp or supply provider, that's going to assist your local EMA. So let them know you're there. Let them know what you have and let them know what more you can provide if a catastrophic event occurs. If you're in an urban area, please assist your local emergency management agency in thyroid development, especially if you're a critical infrastructure provider. There are a lot of corporate uh, critical infrastructure providers, and your response assets are part of that whole community uh, approach. And if you have your own emergency response assets, you ought to do your own thyra. So developing the local thyra and integrating into the community response plan is a really good idea. So again, from the last slide, it's really important. It was kind of buried in the, uh, in the verbiage there, but it's there. Jurisdictions must maintain membership in EMAC in order to uh, be eligible for NPGP funding fiscal year 2013 and beyond. OK, so we're going to take a short little breath here and say, all right, we've learned a lot about Thyro. We've learned about the capabilities approach. We've understood about whole communities. But you know, we talked a bit about it. It doesn't say in the guidance document. If you actually look at the FIRA uh, guidance information, it's paper-based in terms of your measurement. So does this mean we should have a paper and, and people-based solution to this? We would suggest that at Emergency Visions, no. There should be tools and techniques that assist you in measuring your response capacities and assist you in uh, evaluating and, and providing things over time. So let's take a look at FIRA and the whole community and the reason that we need an integrated technology-based approach to capturing this information. So the problem really is that government, nonprofits, and corporations, if you're trying to identify what you have, uh, obtain what you need, and manage it when it, you need it to, to be there for daily operations and catastrophic events, doing it on paper is, is going to be very resource intensive. Both natural disasters and man-made events are obviously increasing in number. And if you could find a way to discover what you have and what more you need and where you need to be it, manage it when you get there, is going to really prepare you better in a whole community approach that ultimately would save lives and, and improve property. The catalyst for this is obviously the grant programs are being consolidated in fiscal year 2013 and beyond. The funding is going to be based on risk-based assessments and your capacity and performance measurements. FEMA's whole community approach intends to connect these folks anyway. And then in third, paper-based solutions or disconnected uh, systems are not going to easily address these requirements. How do we know that? Well, let's take a look at it. So first of all, currently on the side, uh, left-hand side of the screen here, it's a manual, slow, disjointed, and uncoordinated and expensive process if you're trying to do everything on paper. There are some counties in urban areas that have you know, 40, 50 different spreadsheets of assets. And that's just within their own organization. Can you imagine doing it for the corporations, for the mutual aid partners, and the NGOs as well? So if you're going to try to uh, address this uh, on paper, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be time consuming, and it's going to be hard to consolidate. Now, a lot of uh, different folks have technology systems. A lot of emergency management agencies already have a system for managing their uh, emergency operations center, like a web EOC or an E-team. Some of them already have personnel and badging systems. Some do some credentialing capabilities. Some have uh, fleet systems, some do volunteer management capabilities. Well, technology is great, but if it's not integrated, it also could be a problem. 
where disconnected or loosely integrated systems are very expensive to be able to interface, and they may not address some of the needs with respect to assessments and planning. So then third, you add in the, uh, the uh, factor that many organizations lack the qualified subject matter expertise to respond to the different kinds of threats that you're facing. So as you go through your there's five or if you identify something that requires additional, additional personnel from a credential basis, then it's kind of important to identify that and to document it appropriately. On the right-hand side of the screen, an integrated technology solution would provide you with an accessible, secure, and scalable way to measure your threats, to be able to, to catalog your capacities, to be able to catalog your reach back to in the whole community approach, to feed your response plans with this information, and then to measure your improvements over time. So if you could do this in a way that it protects your investments in existing systems, so you're not throwing anything out, you're just integrating it all together easily with a new approach, that's probably a really good way of handling it. So what you're looking at is really a complete consequence management solution, being able to take Thyra and your assessments, dovetail them into your capacity to respond, credentialing your personnel, being able to understand the reach back to your whole community for response, relief, services, and supplies, figuring out from your plans how to move all these assets to where they need to be, and that might include storing it once it gets there, whether that's through an inventory or warehouse management approach or a staging system. And then being able to ultimately, as the event has occurred, be able to have, tie in your event and operations management systems, visualize things through geospatial maps, be able to, to see these assets in real time, figure out how long it's going to take to get uh, your reach backs for equipment or supplies or personnel, and to be able to dove that, dovetail that back in from a mitigation perspective all the way back to assessments uh, post-event so you can really improve on your capacities to respond on an annual basis, which is what's going to be measured anyway. So the key benefits of having a technology to do this in an integrated approach is it will provide you really with an end-to-end -end solution. It would take and protect your investment in what you already have and fill in what you need. It's a whole community approach from your own capacities to the nonprofit to the corporate capacities. It allows you to have an inner organizational collaborative working environment with some visualization tools that can let you see that and be able to measure your capacities, track your personnel and your resources over time, and then again, figure out through lessons learned what you need to do a little bit better and dovetail to that right back into your ongoing assessments and your ongoing planning initiatives. Daily operational value would also result from an integrated solution. You could discover, move, and manage because that, you know, we, we respond at the local level of structural fires every day. Why not be able to do, be able to catalog your response assets, be able to reach out to your partners even on a smaller scale, and be able to visualize that and improve your emergency response through that technology. Governments, NGOs, and corporations do work together on, uh, every day on non-emergency efforts. And this software, in, in an integrated approach, would allow you to optimize your efforts for special events, for regular events, and for catastrophic events. Now, of course, as an organization, you probably imagine, and this is my shameless plug for who we are as an organization, we do have a tool that does that. So uh, we've got an immediate value to develop and sustain through a logistics and consequence management solution. Emergency Visions does have a product called Response Vision. We are helping folks do emergency response logistics in a one-stop shop. It is an all-hazard risk-based design. It's built to foster collaboration through the whole community. And we have customers uh, where we've done everything from uh, cataloging resources to adding in the supplier world to doing traffic transportation, shipping, warehouse management, and ultimately the operations and visualization. It's a scalable cloud-based solution. It also operates in a disconnected and portable environment. And we have a full set of subject matter expertise to make sure that we're successful with our clients of implementing this kind of solution. It does work with Esri's ArcGIS for situational awareness. That's one of our partners. And uh, it's a offering that we're putting worldwide, not only through um, uh, government partners, but, but uh, nonprofit and humanitarian aid partners around the globe. But it doesn't have to be just our kind of solution. Again, the top takeaway from this webinar is that there are really three actions for Thyra and for the fiscal year 2013 that you really need to be focused on. Number one, complete a Thyra. Include your urban area Thyras if you're the state, if applicable, and file your state preparedness report by, September, uh, by December 31st, 2012 this year uh, in order to uh, address the fiscal year 2012 uh, Thyra requirements. Starting in 13, your local assessments are going to be critical to your receipt of funding based on your capability assessments, your risks, and your uh, performance measurements, which are annual. Number two, and please ensure that your EMAC membership is current at the state and local levels. That's a requirement to be eligible for the MPGP funding in fiscal year 2013 and beyond. And then third, 
take a good look at identifying, evaluating, selecting, and implementing some kind of integrated technology solution. It's going to save you time and money instead of dealing with all the paper, all the people, and it'll help you to develop and sustain your capabilities that you're going to measure on a regular basis. Technology really can save you dollars. Now, I've spoken really, really fast as we go through here. Um, I'm now going to open it up. Uh, everyone's been muted for a while, but I'm going to unmute now. and. Um, and also just go ahead and see if um, you have any questions here. By the way, the chat is also open for those of you who want to go ahead and, um, and um, ask questions through the chat. Uh, feel free to go ahead and do that. In just a second, I'll unmute us and we'll open it up for any questions you may have. Please note that a copy of this presentation or how uh, our solution could help you address the FIRA mandate. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us at the... Um, um, website that you see there or the telephone number on the screen. It, uh, we're now open up the questions. If there are any questions, please ask them. Yeah, phone? I lost my phone. Everyone's unmuted. Is there anyone that has a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions for anyone in the audience? Fine. So, I need your help. Okay. Okay. Some prices. Uh, yes, uh, I've got a question at the beginning of the presentation. You stated that we copy of this uh, um, PowerPoint. Yes, sir. Um, are you going to provide that information? Absolutely. So e uh, go ahead and if you like, if you see an email address on the screen, go ahead and email us directly there and we'll provide the presentation directly to you. And then later on today we will upload this PowerPoint to our website at emergencyvisions.com. Okay. But feel free to go ahead and email us directly, and we'll make sure we get it straight back to you. Other questions regarding the content or uh, anything else from anyone else? All right, I'm going to check the chat box here and see if there is any question. All right. Well, uh, it looks like we're good. I'm going to ask one last uh, time if there are any questions. Otherwise, we'll close it off today. All right, thank you so much for your attendance. Really appreciate it, and uh, have a great rest of the